Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Paquin and welcome to EWTN Live. We bring you guests from all over the world and we've got one who's traveled a lot around the world. Especially we're having this show tonight because we're looking forward to Memorial Day this coming Monday. And so we'll be talking with Archbishop Timothy Broglio of the Archdiocese of Military Services of the United States. And we'll talk about the life and ministry of military chaplains and how they affect the lives of service members around the world. Before we get to our guest, though, I just want to talk a little bit with John Elson, who is EWTN's Director of Program Acquisitions and Co-Productions, because we have a special new programming premiering tonight, just a little bit later on after mm -hmm. this show, and it highlights military chaplains. John, how the heaven are you? I'm, I'm, I'm better to be with you, Father. It's thank good to be you. with you. Thank you. I want to thank, uh, as, I've, as I've done, our audience, our Edison family here in studio and at home for their material and spiritual support, which make our production of original programs possible. The program that you, pro you mentioned is, uh, is entitled Frontline Fathers. This mm -hmm. is an uh, original EWTN documentary mm -hmm. that was filmed on location at Camp Humphreys in South Korea. It's a few, uh, few hours south of the capital, Seoul. Mm -hmm. And last September, we had a small team and our friends at CPBC, which is the Catholic Channel in South Korea, uh, joined to come together to tell the story of two active duty U.S. Army chaplains, uh, Father Paul Anthony Halliday of the 2nd uh, Air Combat Brigade and Father Joseph Campbell of the 11th Engineering Battalion, both based at Camp Humphreys. Mm -hmm. And the program details their life and their ministry and the, the, the incredible appreciation that our, 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 our military men and women and their families feel uh, by having these, uh, these, these two pastors uh, on base with them. Many of the soldiers on camera mentioned that although they don't have a home, they have a family. They're on base, and yep. that's really due to the, to the work of these uh, pastors. Yep. Father Joseph Campbell also mentioned that although military families are only 2% of the U.S., uh, comprise 2% of the a number of U.S. Catholics here in, in, in America, they provide 20 percent of the vocations, priesthood and religious vocations. Yeah. So it's an amazingly rich and fertile ground for evangelization. Yeah. So we have a, a brief sample of the show. Yeah, let's which take we a quick share. look at a yeah. clip that we have ready. They'll be showing at 10 p.m. Eastern tonight. So let's take a look at the clip. Things that people have to deal with and go through and cope with here that they don't face back home. And so it's really important, I think, to have someone that understands what sacrifice is. When you're living in a, a war environment, that's all you think about. How do I get closer to God and how do I get closer to God with my fiance? The resulting fireball shot through the house where we were saying mass. And so you have to deal with fear. They uh, lead us by example. They keep us together. And just like a medic attends to physical wounds, chaplains attend to our spiritual wounds. Already the clip looks very, very powerful. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. It really is. A tribute to these pri priests and, and to the, our military men and women overseas. Well, this yeah. is a very, very good thing for us to be introducing as we get ready for Memorial Day. Uh, which remembers those who have died in military service. And we want to thank you, John, for making this available. Uh, again, be sure to watch that tonight. Frontline Fathers at 10 p.m. We'll come back in just a couple minutes with Archbishop Timothy Brolio, so please stay with us.
Thank you, thank you. Welcome back. Yeah, there are well over a million U.S. military personnel stationed at bases and installations all around the world. And the 200 Catholic priests who are military chaplains have a very challenging mission to care for such a numerous, diverse, and widespread group of people. Not all soldiers, airmen, sailors, or Marines are Catholic, but they are all supported in whatever way possible and any way that they're open to by the military chaplains, or the Catholic ones, of the Archdiocese of Military Services of the United States. So we've got a very special guest tonight to tell us more about the mission, the sacrifices, and the blessings of being a military Catholic military chaplain. So please welcome Archbishop Timothy Rolio. Excellency, welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. No, it's our privilege to have you because this is a great service you do. And your diocese is the globe. Indeed it is. It's Some a, enemy territories might not make you too welcome, but you know, overall, it's, the, it's a global that's mission. That's right, wherever, wherever U.S. military are, um, we're responsible for their pastoral care. Yes, so yes. It's, uh, it's an interesting ministry, but it, uh, I like to say the sun is always rising over my archdiocese. That's right, that's <laughs> right. Wait a minute, it's always, always also setting. That's true, too. Yeah, just, just being <laughs> logical. You know Jesuits and their logic. I do, I do, <laughs> with good reason. <laughs> and you know, this is something... Um, that as uh, with only 200 priests in your archdiocese, you have a couple of other bishops though, right? I have, uh, at the moment, I have five auxiliary bishops. Okay. And they're regionalized. So mm -hmm. I have one covers the eastern half of the United States, one covers the western half, mm -hmm. one covers Europe and Asia, and at the moment, two are responsible for the 153 veterans uh, hospitals. Okay. Because they also fall under my yeah, jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the military chap, uh, the hospital chaplains is very important because it's not only older vets who are dealing with, you know, aging and other diseases, but it's also many, many young men and exactly. women who have been hurt in battle recently. That is correct. And also those who suffer from uh, PTSD. Or uh, can which be is? Uh, post-traumatic syndrome disorder. Mm -hmm. So that's after an experience of, uh, well, in this case, an experience of battle, uh, mm -hmm. they they may be disoriented and uh, they need uh, they need help. Yeah, that, it, it's something that uh, w uh, was a problem not well recognized Correct. in the past. Correct. Uh, the veterans of World War II also suffered it in Vietnam, but it really wasn't noticed and it was only in the post-Vietnam period that these problems persisted and that was addressed. Exactly, exactly. And now there, there is treatment, there are a variety of treatments, uh, but there's also obviously a spiritual dimension to all of this. See, and it's it. very, very important that, uh, that we have priests uh, in, in these hospitals to mm -hmm. provide the sacraments, but also to be there uh, as counselors as well. And so folks understand the danger of PTSD, uh, it, it, it's in some ways very different than World War II where there were clearer battle lines, definite armies in uniform, some sabotage here and there, but mostly armies fighting each other, and you saw your enemy, you knew who they were, knew what you fought for. Today, there's a lot of terrorism that's a component of modern warfare. And it's not soldiers, it's civilians who are involved exactly. in that. And so uh, frequently the attacks are shock experiences. And we have 22 suicides a day on average, 22 a day. Those are war casualties. Yeah, they really are, they really yeah. are. And it's uh, it's a, it's a tremendous it's a tremendous problem that uh, uh, the military and the civil society are trying is trying to deal with. But it's mm -hmm. uh, um, it requires a lot of patience. Um, it also requires a lot of uh, listening. 
That's that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, people mm -hmm. who suffer from PTSD yeah. have to be allowed to tell their story. Yeah, and it's not easy. They they sometimes you know one of the issues with the shock, they don't know how to put their story into words. That's correct. That's um, I, I had my own experiences of it working with street gangs in Chicago and witnessing murder and being shot at and things myself. So I have certain experience of that, and uh, it, it's very shocking, you know. One uh, of your but, it's, but it's, I think it's even worse than military battle. One of your Jesuit uh, brothers, Father uh, Rick Curry, did some tremendous mm -hmm. work with, uh, uh, he did with the dramatic narrative, giving them a possibility to tell their story without being interrupted. And at the same time, he also did things with uh, baking, which apparently that was another way that uh, that helped. Uh, them. He was good at making bread. Yes, he was. Recall. He was. Yeah. And he actually supported the ministry with uh, with the bread sales. <laughs> so uh, uh, he'll get my vote <laughs> the, with that list of bread. Um, now, the, the, another source of stress that I'm sure you're dealing with is that the deployments of our military are longer than they were in Vietnam even. Yes. Vietnam was usually, what, a six-month to one-year deployment. Um, now they, they, people are being deployed for years. Well, they're, usually the deployment in, in the Army is usually about a year, mm -hmm. um, about six months in the Air Force. The problem is that they're continually being repeated Mm -hmm. So they, they may be home for a year and then they're back deployed again. Mm -hmm. And for the priests, this is also a problem because we're in very short supply. Therefore, they're deployed even even more frequently. Sure. Um, because obviously they're they're needed. Yeah. 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 And it, it's uh, dangerous for them as well. Uh, Doubly, I mean, in some situations, they're targeted because they're priests. Exactly, exactly. In other places, they're just there with everybody else when incoming bombs come, mortar shells and things like that. And, you know, that's just, just there. So they also are experiencing this. When you, uh, when, when you or the other chaplains go into a battle zone, how well armed are you? Chaplains are not armed at all. That's one of the, uh, the rules of the chaplaincy. So um, priests and other chaplains are never armed. They usually have a figure um, who has different names according to the service, but basically is a chaplain's assistant, and he is uh, charged with the protection mm -hmm. of the chaplain. Mm -hmm. um, so a chaplain is a non-combatant. And that's actually, of course, for us in the Catholic Church, that's actually part of canon law because a priest cannot be, or a, a, an ordained minister cannot be armed um, in, uh, in, a, in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. So that's... Uh, uh, so it's not only that civil law prohibits uh, the chaplains from carrying s sidearms or rifles. Any kind of arms. And as an archbishop, I would have expected at least a 50 cal or something, <laughs> but no, nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing at all, nothing no, at all. No, no. <laughs> and so, so there, there's this real vulnerability, but also Catholic canon law prohibits that. You That's can't correct. be a combat soldier when you're uh, an a ordained minister. That's right. That's right. Now, uh, in this uh, regard, um, what do you see are some of the key aspects of the work chaplains do? What would what be some of their most, uh, when you look at their day, what are they usually dealing with? Well, the most important thing is they are there. They are part of, of the unit. They're embedded in the unit. And so uh, they experience the same things that, the, that those that are, are there with experience, but they're also then known. So that if, if a soldier or if a Marine or a, somebody in the Coast Guard has a problem, he, he knows who he can turn to. And he knows that if he turns to a priest, the priest cannot tell the uh, officers right. or the non-commissioned 
of a, men. A, a chaplain is the only person on a military installation who never has to report who came to see him or why he came to see him. Mm -hmm. He has absolute confidentiality. Mm -hmm. For us, it would be almost like the confessional secret. Yeah. He cannot be obliged to reveal anything that he learned in that uh, colloquium with, uh, with, the, with the military person. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's very much respected by, by the, whole, uh, the whole military. Yeah. So a commanding officer can't say to a chaplain, you know, tell me what so-and-so said to me, said to you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's against the law. Yep. Right now. Right, right now. But one of the things you have to be careful of, and all of us civilians especially, because there are more of us, there are laws trying to be pushed through that would force priests to reveal what they hear in confession. And of course, lawyers, doctors, and uh, ministers, et cetera. Uh, and th they would also want to make themselves free to use intellig uh, intelligence discovery in confessionals and such. I mean, this is very, very serious. Very serious, and that's something that has to be fought. Uh, and it has to be fought primarily on the grounds of religious liberty, which is guaranteed in the Constitution of the United States. Yeah. It's one of the fundamental principles, uh, the First Amendment rights. Yeah. And no it's one... The, it's the first right in the Bill of Rights. Before freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, or freedom of press, is freedom of religion. That's correct. Yeah, so this is something, I mean, the folks you're working with must have a very strong sense of this. They're, they take an oath to defend the to Constitution. defend the Constitution, that's right. And it, it, it is very, very serious. And that's one of the things that we say about, uh, about ensuring that there are Catholic priests in the military is, is that they shouldn't, the first, they, those who defend the Constitution of the United States and put up their right hand to defend it in the trenches shouldn't be deprived of their own freedom of religion. Exactly. So they should be able to practice their religion as, as they see fit. And, you know, we, we've certainly seen, uh, I've heard stories from, especially Protestant chaplains who've spoken to me, that I, I, I don't think Catholics appreciate how the archdiocese is able to help our Catholic chaplains stand up and not, especially if a Protestant minister is from a non-denominational church, he doesn't quite have as much support uh, in terms of structures to protect him when folks from the civilian side of government try to use the military for social experiments. Exactly, and that's one of the, the features that uh uh, as the Archbishop for Military Services, I've been able to address a number of these questions mm -hmm. and give priests very clear guidelines about what they may and what they may not do. And the military has to respect that. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've been on a military installation and have been pulled aside by a Protestant chaplain saying, thank you for that statement. Thank you for taking a stand. We don't have anyone to defend us. Yeah. And we... Yeah. We rely on what you say. And I think this is an important service that we offer to our Christian brothers and sisters because they, they have those rights on a piece of paper, but if you don't, it's like the military. If you don't defend the Constitution, it's gone. It's gone, that's right. And if we don't defend our rights within and the rights of others for their freedom of religion, ours will be gone soon enough. That's you know, we for have sure. to be very concern to make sure that religious freedom is not infringed along with the other rights in the Bill of Rights. Um, this is uh, uh, an important part of what you do. Now, especially though that when you get to be beyond taking care of the chaplains and protecting these larger issues, when you get down to the actual men and women in service, and you know, women are what almost twenty percent yes. mm -hmm. of, of the military service. Uh, so, so there are more women, and they have different concerns than some of the men, um, and it, so we have to deal uh, with the concerns of everybody and the families. Where do you see most of the day spent by chaplains? 
Um, I think they're uh, they're they're pretty well divided between the time that they spend, uh, you know, in the unit, and then also the responsibilities that they have in the in the chapel as well. Um, and so they try to make themselves available to uh, mm -hmm. to everyone because they are, they do care for the families as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that also includes things like religious education. So we have a full curriculum from pre-K to uh, uh, grade 12 of uh, Catholic religious education. And the chaplain is, the Catholic priest is really responsible for making sure that that's available mm -hmm. for the families. Especially when families are living in other countries. You know, like I, I did uh, some volunteer chaplaincy service in Nuremberg uh -huh. at the uh, concerns over there for the and baptized and all that, but taking care of the families and the children is very important. We have, if you don't mind, we'll take a look at a, another clip oh, okay. from uh, Frontline Fathers, this video we're going to show later on, and it also deals with some of the things the chaplains deal with. The Korean War began in 1950 when forces from the North invaded the South. Armed conflict lasted three years and involved the United States operating under the authority of the United Nations Security Council, China and the Soviet Union. The border between the two countries remains one of the most heavily fortified in the world. No peace treaty between the North and South was ever signed, meaning technically the war never ended and that the two countries are stuck in a frozen conflict. A few hours south of the capital Seoul is Camp Humphreys, the largest military base in all of Asia. Father Halliday recently arrived at Camp Humphreys and understands that the demands can be quite different than that of a normal vocation. It's harder and different. What we essentially are doing is we're taking care of the religious needs of, of our soldiers in our unit, um, but we're also making sure that morale is good, uh, that the things that combat can do to wear away at the resolve of a soldier uh, and at the morale of the unit in general, we're, we're there as insulators against those things and to help bring back uh, that morale that needs to be in the unit, both individual and collectively. One, uh, just so we point this out, one of the things I noticed is that uh, Father was wearing epaulets, which indicates that he has some rank on, on those epaulets. There, there's indication of his rank. Uh, so chaplains are officers? That's right. All chaplains in the, in the United States Armed Forces are also officers mm -hmm. in, their, uh, in their respective uh, branch. Mm -hmm. So Father Halliday is a major. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if they're an officer, can they give orders? Well, uh, a chaplain has rank, but he doesn't have command. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so he's, he can't say, look, the general's been shot. I'll take over. No. No, you can't do that. <laughs> Someone else will take over yes. in that situation. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Even if it's an officer of lower rank. Even if it's an officer of lower rank. But yes. it, he's in the rank, the, the line of command. Exactly. Where chaplains are just, they're not in command. They're not in combat. They're there to minister to these other needs. That's correct. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Important. So they make a distinction in the military between line officers and chaplains, doctors, lawyers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Although yeah. doctors and lawyers are, are, are armed, but. Yeah, yeah, but uh, not chaplains. That, yeah. that's, that's another interesting thing, though, that you can be a medical doctor serving in a battlefield um, and you can be armed and fire back if, if sure, if need be, if need if be, need be. Uh, they, they prefer not to, but they, they, they can. Chaplains cannot, cannot, yep. they cannot, yep. they really can't touch a weapon. Yep. And, um, th this is why, um, their, uh, motto is not shoot the son of a guns, but it's, uh, nurture the living, care for the wounded and honor the dead. dead. That's those correct. are the three main, uh, it's a model because those summarizes your ministry. That, 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 that does, that really does. Mm -hmm. And that's all, all the more important for us to have this show now as we get ready for Memorial Day because there are combat losses. 
you know, there aren't quite as many now as we had seen earlier in the, the Middle Eastern theater, but there still are. It's still a reality, and I think when we think about that reality, particularly as Catholics, we have a responsibility to pray for the fallen. Exactly. And not only to pray for the Catholic fallen, but to pray for, for all of the fallen, which is something we do um, on Memorial Day. The Archdiocese sponsors a memorial mass every year mm -hmm. um, in, in order to pray for those who are fallen. And of course, we do remember in a special way the chaplains who die within a calendar year. Mm -hmm. Usually they're sure. from old age, but but uh, we remember them in a special way at, the, at that time. So mass. there have been a number of chaplains who received the Congressional Medal of Honor. That's about nine. And nine of them, I believe, yes. Yeah, I think that's... They are, and it's, it's curious, um, in the 19th and 20th century, the only chaplains to receive the Congressional, uh, to receive the Medal of Honor are Catholic priests. Mm -hmm. Civil War, you had many others, but uh, in uh, in the 19th and 20th century, uh, excuse me, in the 20th and 21st century, only Catholic priests. And in, in some ways, the fact that we're not married and that we don't have children gives us another kind of freedom to take some risks for the sake of others in need. That are and the, the other minister, the chaplains really put themselves into risky situations. But you know, I've heard them say, "I, I have to think twice because yeah. I've got a family." Yeah. You know, and we, we have a, a, another kind of. Well, I, I don't have a family, and there's, there's, you know, these other elements I can do. That is certainly very freeing, and I think that also has also influenced. Uh, uh, it, it's certainly very evident in the in the two. Uh, military chaplains whose causes have been introduced for sanctity, yes. Father uh, Vincent Capodano and, uh, and Father Emile Capon. Both of them went way beyond what would have been expected, just simply, I think, because they had that freedom to, they were going to take care of those assigned to them and whatever it cost. Yeah, Father Emile, well, I've done programs on both of them. Yes, yes. And yeah. done some specials on them both. And, uh, Father Capone, I believe, was in Korea. Korea, correct. And he was a prisoner in a camp and did an awful lot to get food for the prisoners. And we don't ask about all the ways he did it, but he got it done. He was a, he was a good Kansas farm boy. He knew yes, how to. He, was. he knew how to feed the, his men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, the, these are important things. So that it's not only recognition by Congress. For a medal of honor, but ultimately, far higher than that, is being canonized that's right. a saint. That's another army that's going to outlast even not only the United States. It's an army that will outlast the world. That's right. So that's, that's right. a good one. It's uh, there, there have been uh, I got statistics here that 419 chaplains have died in during duty. You know, uh, various things have happened, uh, mostly in combat that they they get killed, um, and this is uh, you know something that is is higher risk than most parish priests. This is true. This is true, and that is that is certainly a factor, mm -hmm. and it always has to be taken into consideration. Sure. Uh, sure. But I, I've you know uh, certainly known a number of military chaplains, and it's. Uh, truly an admirable uh, group of priests. You know, so I, I look very much up to them. Uh, they, they know their job. They have this sense of focus. And I would just say that uh, we've got to take a break, but um, i got to say that the sense of focus that comes with military training and the focus on military duty seems to be a factor in so many vocations coming out of the military. There's a selflessness to all military people, chaplains, but everybody in the military has a certain selflessness about them. That's true, and a desire to serve. Yep. And, and I think also a desire to, or a willingness to work in a hierarchical uh, situation. So those are also uh, qualities that uh, 
are determinate in terms of a priestly vocation mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, what about five percent of uh, all Catholic priests in the country now have a military background. Five percent of those ordained in 2019, yes, came yeah. from were prior service, yeah. and another 17 percent came from military families. Which, uh, because that, that also spills over to their families. Of course it that, does. That sense of, of discipline and duty and such, it, it just spills over. And sometimes it's a source of humor and jokes among uh, army brats and such, but it really does make a difference in the way that they, they act. Yes, yes, it does, it does. Yeah. Well, look, let's take a break now. All right. We'll come back in a couple of minutes. If you have any questions for Archbishop about the uh, chaplaincy, what they're doing, the role of the church in its relationship with the military and with the soldiers, please feel free to call in. We'd love to hear from you. So thank you, and we'll be back in just a couple minutes. Well, we are with Archbishop Timothy Brolio of the U.S. Military Chaplaincy Archdiocese. Are you ready for some questions from our folks? Certainly. Let's start off with Joanne. Joanne, where are you calling from? Aberdeen, New Jersey. Wonderful. What is your question tonight? Do men who eventually become chaplains have to take any special, additional special training such as more psychology or stress management, even stress management for themselves, for this very uh, demanding uh, mm -hmm. part of uh, their priesthood. It's a special priesthood. Do they take any special, extra special courses? Great question. Very I like good question. that. Yes. Let, let me ask, just as a pre-question to that, um, what about the 
boot camp <laughs> training. What kind of physical training do they have to have before they are commissioned as officers? Well, all of the uh, chaplains uh, or chaplain candidates have to go through a uh, officer training uh, school. And in that is also physical training as well as you know learning yeah. how to salute and military etiquette and all of those things. And in that uh, period, they, they do receive some um, psychological training as well. But then uh, all of the chaplains then are required to go to a chaplain school. So the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army all have chaplain schools. And for during each that, branch. For each branch. Okay. And they're in, th they're in three different locations. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that time, they, they learn a number of things. They continue the, the military training because, of course, they're all uh, going to be military officers. But they also do things that are very chaplain specific, mm -hmm. uh, part of which would be counseling, part of which would be stress management, part of which would be the whole ecumenical interfaith nature mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. chaplaincy because obviously they're coming from all sorts of different tra traditions. They have to work together. They have to share space. Um, and so all of that is done at chaplain school. Then... Later on, after someone's been a chaplain for a while, he can be sent for additional uh, training, which can be in family life ministry, it can be in ethics, it can be in many, many different things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then that's, that's a part of their, their training as well. So um, th there's some basic common training for all tra chaplains to understand the military then to understand military chaplaincy. Correct. And then if they want, they can specialize in specific areas. Right. And I imagine the, the chaplains that you have working at the Veterans Administration are also given, you know, if they want extra training for dealing with the PTSD and the other traumas. This, this is correct. Have. Now, of course, all the uh, chaplains in any uh, hospital of the, of the Department of Veterans Affairs have to have uh, clinical pastoral education. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a, a basis. And then they can they can specialize as well in the, sure. in the time. Um, the advantage, of course, of being a chaplain in the VA is they don't uh, you don't have to meet the weight uh, the weight requirements. Uh, you don't have to be physically fit, and they don't shoot at you. Generally not. That's Generally good. not. That's <laughs> good. That's good. Yeah. Uh, that that would be a good thing. And, and also, just so um, folks understand, at times, the, uh, a particular chaplain may be the only chaplain. It's not as if there's always an array of 15 denominations at every base. That's correct. And so sometimes Catholic priests, as they do on uh, various ships, may do a, a service, that like a Bible service for the non-Catholics? No. No? No. Okay. Um, basically, what the, the, the military rule is that you, you provide um, the service of your, your denomination. Okay. But if you can't uh, help the person, then you find a way that, that his need can be met, either through a lay leader Mm -hmm. or through some other uh, function. Now, we have had exceptions to that rule. A few years ago, there was only one chaplain at the embassy in Iraq, mm -hmm. and it happened to be a Catholic priest. So he also provided, uh, well, it was, he actually did uh, uh, Vespers, but they didn't call it Vespers, and that was the Protestant word service. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. he, he did provide both. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I've certainly, uh, on, non-military ships, uh, ships, on uh, uh, civilian lines, ships, yeah, yeah. cruises and things like that. Oftentimes chaplains will do a uh, service for Jewish people on a Saturday morning, uh, Protestants on a Sunday morning, and Catholic Mass as well, you know, so that they, but that's not the case that's in the military. Not, no, that's not the case okay. in the military. All right. Um, let's take a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from Sugarland, Texas. Nice pl place over there. I like Thanks it. Thanks very much. And um, your uh, question? Uh, Father, I was wondering, what is your military background? All right. I was never in the military. I was a, uh, uh, a Vatican diplomat, actually, for 25 years. Before that, I was a parish priest. Um, but basically, my responsibilities are pastoral care of people in the military, in the VA, and their families. So for that, I really don't need military expertise. What I need is to be able to be a, a good shepherd, a good diocesan bishop. 
How did you get the position that you have? The superiors of the Secretary of State asked me to, uh, to take it. So, uh, Not to mention your boss, the Pope. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> the appointment came from uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. We have another caller. Uh, Michael, where are you calling from? Michael, are you online? Yes, brother. I'm on, brother. Thank you, brother Mitch. Sure. Where, you. where are you calling from? Uh, Spokane, Washington. Ah, nice town. Home and what is your Air question? Home of, home of Fairchild Air Force Base. Correct. There you go. We know that, yeah, we know there's a huge, and thank you, Archbishop, for your service. We know there's a huge shortage of military chaplains. Um, how do you recruit, where do you recruit military chaplains? That's a very good question, and thank you very much for, for asking that. Yeah. Um, there's actually two routes. One is each service, each chaplain service, has a recruiter. So the Navy has a recruiter, the Air Force has a recruiter, and uh, the Army has a recruiter. And they are um, charged, they're tasked with uh, finding Catholic priests who can serve in the military. Uh, however, the Archdiocese also has two programs of its own. One is the co-sponsored seminarian program, which uh, allows someone who's studying for the uh, diocesan priesthood to be co-sponsored by the Archdiocese for Military Services. We assume half of his formation costs, and we also encourage him to do some of the training and to be a chaplain candidate during his seminary years. Once he's ordained, if he's ordained, he goes um, to his diocese for at least three years in a parish, mm -hmm. a regular parish situation. Then he comes on active duty for at least five years. Mm -hmm. So that's one avenue. Uh, second, at the end of June, we'll have what we call For God and Country, mm -hmm. which is a you know, work week from Monday to Friday. We invite 10 priests to come to Washington to be the guests of the Archdiocese for the Military Services, to visit military installations in the Washington Military District, talk to Catholics who talk to them about what it means to have a Catholic priest mm -hmm. on active duty. And that program, uh, we've done it now for four years, has been very, very effective in uh, recruiting uh, priests for military mm -hmm. service. And of course, we ask before they come for this, this uh, short week, we ask them to uh, make sure their bishop knows that they're coming because of course, <laughs> ultimately he has to give, yeah. or their religious superior, that person has to give permission. Yeah, there's the certain surprises you don't want to put at your bishop or superior's doorstep. This is, this is true. That's one of them. That's one of them, yes. <laughs> you know, and I had another, um, question uh, that came. If a, if a young man, a young priest, uh, does, after say three years in a parish, and that's a good idea, to get to know normal priestly work in a parish, get the rhythm of parish life, and then be in, be in the military. Can he serve, say, say he agrees to serve five years, but can a chaplain serve as long as he likes? Is there a limit? That's, What's That's a very good question, Father Mitch. And uh, a chaplain can serve um, like any officer until he's 62. So, okay, when he's 62, uh, he has to retire. Now, we have been successful in getting extensions, mm -hmm. which in the military are called waivers, um, so that a person can, that a priest can serve for maybe an extra two or three years. We did have... Uh, one priest who was with the uh, 82nd in, uh, at uh, Fort Bragg, who was over 70 when he uh, finally retired. Is that uh, right? But that was exceptional. Uh, yeah, how long had he served altogether? Um, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know, but I would say over 30 years. Because, uh, you know, I think there's an admiral, uh, I think it was Rickover, who served longer than any other officer in the history of the military. True, because they also have rules about that, too. Yeah, you, right. You can also time out as well as age out. And then I met one enlisted man who finally retired from the Navy in 83. I went to his retirement uh, ceremony uh, on an aircraft carrier. Mm. He served as a, as a, uh, 
uh, bosun's mate. And he uh, had been in the military since 1938. Oh my gosh. He wow. was the longest, uh, uh, you know, enlisted man, uh, non-com. He, he apparently went up and down the enlisted ranks <laughs> over that, <laughs> over that long period, period. <laughs> uh, almost 50 years. But he was the longest serving enlisted man in the history of the Navy or any and other probably branch. Probably any other branch yeah, as well. Yeah. He, yeah. he started uh, before World War II and then just kept going. And he was sort of upset. He didn't want to retire. <laughs> he liked it that well. <laughs> when it, it t just take uh, one more look at a clip from Frontline Fathers, which is our video that's going to show tonight at 10 p.m. Let's take a look at that clip. Father Joseph Campbell is another Catholic chaplain on base, and here at Camp Humphreys, he has been inspired and encouraged by the genuine desire the soldiers have for a Catholic priest on base. I think the soldiers really, really appreciate their chaplains. I was surprised by that because I was thinking I was going to bump into a bunch of guys who are too cool for school, and their eyes were on fire. The family's uh, desire for a good priests and their gratitude for the priesthood, they make a lot of sacrifices. So being separated for the first time for many of these soldiers from their families is a huge transition. If you remember back to when you went off to college, that's just like the tip of the iceberg for a lot of these kids. One of the reasons I love being a priest is because it calls us to an intimacy with our Lord that's like no other to be invited into their homes, to share in their life their most intimate um, moments of sadness, but also joy, you know? To be able to share in their marriage preparation and at the same time baptize their kids, to help memorialize their fallen brothers and sisters. It's an awesome, awesome gift. I, th I think that clip brings out a very important element that it, when any young man or woman joins the military, it's not like going to college <laughs> at all. I mean, there is really a, a, a certain like redoing of your personality. Your head is shaved. You don't get to wear the clothes that you use as your own self-identity. That's correct. And you don't get to comb your hair the way you like to have your self-identity, and you are put into a type of mold and a certain response and activity, certain level of rewards and punishments, especially in the early stages, are part of this, uh, in college you might call it hazing, but that's, that's, again, that's amateur, that's nothing. This is about life and death preparation to serve with other people. And this calls for a lot of special kind of uh, uh, ministry. It really does because you're, you're taking uh, your average 18 year old and you're transforming him into uh, someone who's part of a unit, someone who's going to fight, someone who has to take his responsibilities. I mean, I've been on aircraft carriers and you watch these, pardon the expression, with these kids, um, direct a, and, and, you know, get a plane to take off and get that plane to land. And they have Fix tremendous, <laughs> they have tremendous responsibility. Yep. Uh, and, and it's because they've been, they've been molded, but by the same token, uh, you know, they may have come from a, a very uh, comfortable lifestyle and, and all of a sudden they're thrown into uh, this regimen where there are serious expectations and there are consequences if uh, you don't perform the way uh, you're expected to perform. And they also come, because uh, there are a lot of folks who come from uh, deprived situations, very poor situations. This is their way to move into society, to leave behind, uh, and they really are leaving behind their old neighborhood and some of the dangers there for another set of dangers but also for another set of discipline that really transforms them. So uh, this is a special kind of ministry to tr help these young people transition through 
a series of identity changes as they become uh, soldiers, sailors, Marines, and uh, people uh, Airmen, in the air. Yes. And that is, that's very true. And you, you have to walk with them um, because, of course, they're also making that transition from, uh, uh, you know, into adulthood as well. Uh, we don't, well, that's... And, and that's all of those things, uh, the ability to have someone that you can, that you can confide in is, is very, very important. Yep, yep. And, and trust that it's what you say stays and stays that it's there. very per still that that depth of my personality is respected by someone when the military is re reforming <laughs> my personality exactly so that's important well, one of the things i want our audience to also understand is that there are a number of ways to give support i think c compared to when I was a kid, and you're just a couple years behind me. The the vets from Vietnam, you know, didn't make choices to start the war or continue it and everything, but they suffered a lot of negative consequences, not only from combat, but then when they came back and were rejected. Now we have a far more positive respect for our military. People thank them constantly. That's a great, great change uh, for people who are so selfless. But I, I think we can also show a, a kind of support for the uh, sailors, soldiers, Marines, and airmen in the way that we as Catholics are able to help support your archdiocese. People military payroll are not making a lot. No, they are not. Uh, it, 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 the top officers still, if they were in the business, civil society, would be making much, many much times more. over what they're making now. Yeah. And so there's not a lot, and certainly the enlisted people are not making much. I think for us to respond to the generosity of the chaplains and of all the sailors, soldiers, Marines, and airmen, that we can give support. Uh, you have a special collection on Veterans Day. That's this it. weekend, we celebrate those who died and gave their lives for our nation. Veterans Day, we, we celebrate those who served and survived. Exactly. That's a great time for that collection. It is, and I'm very grateful to my brother bishops for permitting this collection every three years, which gives the archdiocese the funds that uh, she needs in order to, uh, uh, well, support the co-sponsored seminarians, support the maintenance of sacramental records, run the archdiocesan tribunal, uh, fund the travel of uh, the auxiliary bishops and myself, uh, send uh, people to train catechists. So all of that Catechetical is- Catechetical materials. Exactly, all of that is on the shoulders of, uh, of the archdiocese. And so we're very grateful to the support that we receive from, uh, from Catholics all across the nation so in this collection. This week, uh, please pray for all those who died. And then on Veterans Day, remember the military by your own generosity so that they can continue this work. And would you join me in giving a blessing? Certainly would. May Almighty God bless, bless you all and keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Excellency, we want to thank you so much for being here with us, uh, taking up from your very busy schedule of a global diocese. Yes. And um, we uh, can only keep you and all the other folks in the military in our prayers. I appreciate that thank very you. much. Thank God you. God bless. God bless you.